Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Let's Talk Fantasy Football. I'm your host tonight. My name is Nick Walsh. I'm here with my good friend, my good pal. I'm here with the D-O-N, Don Chrisman himself, the D-O-N-M-D, some might say, after the, uh, the way he spoke about injuries last week, and I'm sure the way he will tonight. Don, what is going on tonight, dude? Walsh, I'm ready to lay out some uh, more injury updates and get ready to rock and roll for this week. All right, man. That's good to hear. Um, we're definitely going to be doing some rocking and some rolling, I think. Um, but before we get into that, I, I do just want to, um, you know, on, on a real note, I, I want to dedicate this podcast um, to Let's Talk Fantasy Football's number one fan, really, from from day one. Uh, he would listen to, you know, every single podcast, and I think he, he pretty much has from the beginning. Um, but but my dad, Tim Walsh, uh, passed away this this past Monday morning. Um, so, you know, we'd like to, we'd like to dedicate this one to him. Um, he's even made a cameo on the podcast before, basically, uh, basically to just tell Shrek that the, the Raiders were going to beat the Chiefs and knock him out of the playoffs last year, but he, he made the cameo nonetheless. So, um, you know, this, this one's, this one's for you, dad. And, uh, and, you know, in my case, this, this season is, and, and also, I guess on a, on a very real note, I'd just like to say, uh, thank you to all you guys who, who listen because, um, you know, football and fantasy football and uh, doing preparation and everything for the podcast, for the site um, has really helped me over the past couple of days. So um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a privilege and, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun to be able to do this, um, you know, all the time. And, and it, uh, it, it definitely, you know, has, has helped me out a lot over the, over the past couple of days. Um, so, so yeah, with, with that, we'll, um, we'll get right into it, I guess. But first, first we should say that uh, Let's Talk Fantasy Football is sponsored by No Halftime. The no Halftime app isn't your typical fantasy sports service. You get to create one-on-one -on -one fantasy matchups, and you can use the code LTFF for a free sign-up bonus. So, Don, tonight we got a lot to talk about. We're going to talk injuries, news, some cool shit, some weak shit, some waiver wire pickups, uh, a quick preview of the Thursday night game, and, and then I believe you have a Timmy Treat of the Week. Is that correct? Yeah, we got a Treat of the Week for sure, man. Oh, man. I can't wait oh, to man. talk about uh, it. We got a very full <laughs> slate, dude. Let's, uh, let's jump on into it. So we'll start with the injuries here. Don, I'm going to let you uh, lead on this since you are our, uh, our resident injury expert, it appears. Um, so <laughs> so take it away, buddy. Let me, let me know what's happening in the, in the world of NFL injuries because it is a lot. All right, man. So just when you would think my AFC team Chargers would bolt up, get ready to move past the ACL tear of Keenan Allen when their very crafty Danny Woodhead has torn his ACL as well on his right knee and is definitely out for the rest of the season. This is a big hit for the team themselves and all of us fantasy players here. Very devastating. Yeah. Um, what do you think – you know, obviously, if you're a Danny Woodhead owner, um, this sucks. You know, you didn't pay too much for him, most likely, but it still sucks to have to drop one of your running backs after the second week. Yeah. But if you're a Melvin Gordon owner, uh, what does this do for you? Is he like he's he's like locked and loaded rest of the season right now? Yeah, you're definitely licking your chops for this if you're a Melvin Gordon owner. Um, it's, it's been encouraging to see one that he's been. In the, you know, they've been playing him with goal line and red zone, and he's been scoring touchdowns. But now that just opens up so much more um, for getting more snaps, probably going to be getting some uh, more passes in as well. So that's a, a big up for Melvin Gordon. Yeah, absolutely. Due to, an, due to an unfortunate event, you must take advantage. Oh, yeah, 100%. You know, we uh, obviously we don't like to see anyone get hurt, but, um, you know, we uh, – it get people getting hurt in the NFL leads to opportunity opportunity leads to fantasy production. That's something that we can take advantage of. Um, Adrian Peterson of the Vikings tore his meniscus. What's going on here? All right. So Adrian Peterson. So it looks, it actually could be good news for everyone with Adrian Peterson and the torn meniscus. Cause the way he was uh, walking out with the guys holding him, you had the scare of the ACL. He's had the ACL injury before. Um, so it's undetermined on when he's coming back. Um, he's not even ruled out for this game against Carolina, which is crazy, but Adrian Peterson is, is a – he's not even human. So um, count him out, though. Uh, he's, even if he were to play, which I, I would doubt they would want to come, come back right away, especially against a pretty stout Carolina defense. Um, 
But it's encouraging news that they're not even counting him out right away. So let him sit um, for this week. The only thing that is in question is who is going to be taking the lead back from here. At first, yeah, I thought it, no, go ahead, Walsh. I, I was going to say it's it's interesting because I think the assumption was McKinnon like all the way for pretty right. much all of us. But Asiata actually got more of the work after Peterson left the game, which sucks because right. no one likes playing Matt Asiata ever. And right. everyone likes playing Jerry Mc, Jarek McKinnon because he's fun to watch. Right. Um, but, but yeah, it, it's difficult. And, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, McKinnon was probably owned in your league. If he wasn't, you should probably pick him up. Would you add Matt Asiata? <sighs> yeah. The more that I've been hearing and, and reading about Matt Asiata, it looks like, especially because of goal line carries – it's going to be Asiata that's going to be, you know, uh, scoring the touchdowns if it's going to be anyone. Matt Asiata in 2014, when uh, AP was out, had nine touchdowns. And I'm pretty sure McKinnon had none. Yeah. So if you're looking for the upside, I believe I would actually go Asiata. Okay. That's, uh, that's fair. It's, it's going to be – I mean, like, I get why they give him a role because he's a good goal line back and he's a good pass blocker. But, man, I wish they would just make Jarek McKinnon the feature back because he's really fun. Yeah, um, he, he is good. But it's – who knows? With that, with that goal line carries, it looks like he's going to be vulturing those TDs. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just again with Peterson, keep an eye on it. Um, it could just be a couple weeks. It could be this week. If he chooses – if he elects to have surgery, it could be three to four months, which is basically the season. So yeah. – um, We'll kind of see with that going forward. Emil, excuse me. Whoa, jeez. This is uh, – I, I started having my podcast beers before the podcast. That's, that's no good. Um, that, that could be the opener itself. Just, yeah, yeah. Just, just the burp. <laughs> All right. So, anyway, Amir Abdullah, Amir Abdullah sprained his foot uh, and is likely out for several weeks. They say he's traveling to North Carolina to meet with a specialist – um, what, what's your take here? I mean, he's out for several weeks. Is Theo Riddick the guy? Is Dwayne Washington the guy? Well, what, what do you think here? I think, I think Theo Riddick would kind of keep the same, um, keep the same role, which would give Washington that, that more of the, uh, the short yardage work. Um, I do still like, I still think that raises Riddick's uh, value up quite a bit, but again, I don't think he's going to be that, you know, the cowbell just running the, you know, taking the full share. So that's yeah, my... yeah. Theor- Theoretic's not like a, you know, he he's not in every single down back. So right. they, they they need someone to compliment compliment him. You would assume that would be Dwayne Washington, right? But Riddick's gonna have an out like an you know an increased role, I would think, based on all of this because Abdullah did catch some passes. Um, I I think Riddick's like an every week starter at this point. Absolutely. All right, um, so, so moving on from there, we have Jonathan Stewart, uh, hamstring injury. Um, we saw Fozzie Whitaker have a big game this past week with him out. Um, what's, what's your take on this situation in terms of how long he's going to be out, uh, and then who really is the play here, whether it's Whitaker or someone else in that backfield? Well, as you all know here at LTFF, I don't hold grudges. So my take is Fozzie Whitaker, you should have been taking this role last year when he was out and I needed you in the championship (laughs) to do something, and you didn't. Um, (laughs) As I digress, uh, Fozzie Whitaker did have a big game, though. Um, But I think they are going to split time. I think Cameron Aris Payne is going to come in. I don't know. You're going to probably see, like, last year, then Tolbert was in quite a bit. So I wouldn't fully just – put all my chips, you know, uh, my eggs in all my basket with Fozzie Whitaker there. I would kind of stay away from them, especially because they have a tough matchup this week. So I would not, you know, just jump on that board right away. Yeah, I would think Whitaker and Cameron Artis Payne have to be owned. I still don't think Tolbert's really worth owning because he's just, he doesn't have a ton of upside. He's basically a, you know, a touchdown and a couple catches maybe. Right. Um, but it's it's worth noting, you know, the reason Cameron Artis Payne didn't play this past week, for those of you saying, you know, if he was going to play a role, why didn't he do it this past week? He was a healthy scratch. The, the Panthers basically keep three running backs 
um, you know, on their roster active each week. One of them is Stewart. One is Whitaker because of the passing down work. One is Tolbert because of, um, you know, the goal line and, and also some passing down work. So Curtis Payne was basically a healthy scratch the whole year last year until Stewart got hurt. And then he did see a decent role. Um, right. So you would expect the same thing again to happen here. Um, Doug Martin, also a hamstring injury, similar as Stewart. They, they described it as a slight tweak, but like they also made him have take, like get an MRI today. So that sounds like more than a slight tweak to me. I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. Uh, is it just Charles Sims here? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, you know, I think Charles Sims is going to be that back because they, they love Charles Sims too. So Charles Sims is going to get quite a bit. And I think you should, I think he's actually a startable player for this week. Oh yeah. I, I think he's, um, I, I think he's, uh, you know, a great start for this week. I, I forget who exactly they're playing. Wait, no, I do know this. Who the hell was it? I was looking at it right before. Is it Los Angeles? They're playing the Rams this week. Yeah. So, so it is Los Angeles. So he's um, going to, that's, that's a favorable matchup. Uh, I mean, you got th- that front line. That's a little tough, but especially in the pass game that can open up Charles Sims quite a bit. Yeah, he's a guy who can catch passes as well. So he's he's going to be a great start if if Doug Martin is out this week. Um, along which, which the lines of, be. I, I'm pretty sure that he's going to be out this week. Fair enough. The DO, the DONMD says he's going to be out. Therefore, he's going to be out. <laughs> I believe it. Um, continuing with the trend of running backs, you know, having issues. Thomas Rawls had a leg contusion. Um, it's not really a concern for him being available week three, but I mean. Christian Michael was way better than him when he was in this past week, which is worth noting. Uh, you know, he was hurt early on in the game and, and kind of Michael had the rest of it, but um, it just muddies the waters here, really, right? Do you see any sort of clarity in, in this Seahawks running situation? Well, yeah, you know what? It's just another setback for Rawls, especially starting with the preseason and, and, all, and not, you know, not being in the preseason due to hurt and sickness and them thinking that Michael's had a good preseason. Then we didn't know who the starter was right away. And now this guy has the starting uh, role last week, gets hurt again. It's nothing serious, but that just puts one more step back for him where you might see more Michael. So it's kind yeah. of your Thomas Rolls, you know, owner, you know, I wouldn't be overly worried about it. But again, it's not someone where I'm rushing to start Rolls now because you can temper your expectations for any productivity for the, um, the near future as of now. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, Jimmy Garoppolo had a, was having a great game up until he sprained his AC joint. He was apparently limited in practice today, uh, but I mean, they play a Thursday game. You would have to think that, that he's not going to play a Thursday game after spraining his AC joint. Um, what does this do in terms of Long-term outlook, I mean, Brady's only suspended one more week after week three. And then is Jacoby Brissett um, enough to kind of buoy the, the Patriots' production where their, their skill position players are still usable? I don't know, man. I, you know, it's, it's crazy. It's the Patriots, dude. I, I, you just can't count them out. You would think that, like, they would have a little bit of a rough time, even with Garoppolo. But Garoppolo just goes in there, and it's just like, Nothing happened. Oh, no Gronk, no Brady. It's okay. We're still going to ruin everyone's day. So um, the the encouraging thing was um, Brissett looked pretty composed out there. For someone that's a third-string uh, QB rookie, you, you wouldn't know. But he came out there and he looked pretty composed. So he might just have enough to um, get the job done. You're not going to see anything spectacular, that's for sure. Um, but even if they could come out with you know one more win before Brady comes back. That's what you yeah. should expect there. Yeah, you you would think a, a, another win would be I would be good. It's going to be a tough matchup this Thursday against the Texans, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, but you know, hopefully Garoppolo is back for Week Four because he has looked very very good so far this year. Uh, another quarterback getting hurt, rookie starting. Josh McCown went down with a shoulder injury. The uh, the quote was that it's a good chance it could cost him several games. We saw him be kind of productive. Do you do you think Cody Kessler's, you know, like the – I mean, I, sh- I should mention Cody Kessler's going to start, but is is that a situation we should monitor? Is is that um, – does that mean anything to you or is it kind of just like, eh, it's the Browns? 
Uh, eh, it's the Browns. Uh, what is it? I think Cody Kessler is the fifth QB to start for the Cleveland Browns in the last five weeks that they've played um, a regular season game. That's so, insane. That's <laughs> that's the Cleveland Browns for you. Um, you know, it was, it was nice to see, you know, kind of how we expected too. We saw um, a little bit more productivity out of your um, out of your fantasy players with, you know, um, with the Cleveland Browns there with McCown being in. You saw a boost. We were all excited with, you know, him being in instead of RG3. But now you got Cody Kessler coming in. Um, temporary, obviously, every expectation you would have for the Browns, especially with him being in. So, again, the, everyone downgrades now with McCown being back out. Yeah, Cody Kessler looked – Pretty pretty bad in the preseason, uh, yeah. so I, I I wouldn't really expect too much. Uh, right. Dom, talk to me about the Jets wide receiver Brandon Marshall and Eric Decker. Huge scare last week with Brandon Marshall. I know we talked about uh, you and Vinny talked about it last week because we were um, what you call it was after the Thursday night game, mm-hmm. um, but that was a huge scare. It looked way worse. Well. MCL injury still not good, but we were all in the scare of a, an ACL there. But the guy beasted out. He came back out and friggin' had himself a game. So, uh, no, though not a sprain, we'll see. I mean, so it's showing that he sat out Monday's practice, unsure, unsure for the weekend. But, I mean, he did come back out and play right away. So, that's encouraging. So, you can hope that Brandon Marshall does come back. Yeah, I personally would be surprised if he sits. And I know, like, last year – I think it was last year where there were a couple of games where, um, you know, it was like, oh, Brandon Marshall is a little questionable. And we were like, okay, like, take it easy with him, you know. And then he would just come out and have, like, three touchdowns on, like, four targets. So it's like they would they would sort of abbreviate his usage but still right. use him in the red zone where he can just, like, be a bully in the paint. Right. Um, and then also talk to me about Eric Decker uh, and, and his practice situation. So I didn't know, but he's apparently he's currently dealing with a shoulder injury that I guess happened during Thursday night game, which I didn't notice, um, but I just read, recently read up on. Um, the encouraging news and confirmed by his wife via social media is that he has a big <laughs> dick. Um, and also replied to a, a tweet once question that it was veiny and all. So <laughs> Eric has a big veiny dick. So I wouldn't worry about that shoulder injury since he has that. So, <laughs> <laughs> if that didn't make your Thursday night, it definitely made mine. <laughs> I, I must have missed that on social media. Oh, yeah. Go back um, and look that up because she was calling him Big Dick, uh, Big Dick Decker on Snapchat. And then, <laughs> and then I forget what source tweeted at her. said me at the like, question is Big Dick. And then she said, yes, veiny and all. So. Jeez. We got to really got a nice uh, picture of Eric Decker's big veiny dick by Wonderful. his wife. Wonderful. So this this is not a false statement. Confirmed. <laughs> Con- confirmed. Don is a doctor, and he can he <laughs> confirmed this. I am an um, MD. <laughs> so yeah, Eric Decker's probably going to play this week. I would think is the the moral of that story. <laughs> um, yeah, slanging it. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I'm coughing. Um, all right. Jay Cutler uh, played last night in the Monday night game. We're recording this on Tuesday in case you couldn't tell. Uh, tell me about Jay Cutler and his situation, and you don't have to call him by name if you don't want to. Oh, I won't. Um, so nothing made my uh, Tuesday morning better than ESPN uh, radio ripping on the quarterback of Chicago all morning on my way to work. No one likes this man. His team doesn't like him. I like him. Only Walsh and Vinny like him. <laughs> but the only Chicago Bear that I like, Brian Hoyer, came in, and I was, I was never so proud to see a Chicago Bear walk onto the field. So I guess the quarterback of Chicago is day-to-day. Who knows? This, it's kind of a trend, though, don't you think? Like Whenever he's getting a lot of pressure, he's getting sacked, this guy – Leaves the games. I remember, I don't know, maybe 2010. This is a while ago when the when the Giants were beating the crap out of him, sacked him like six guys times. He just left the game, the playoff game. He left. the The guy's a, a b i t c h, and I'm glad to see he's not he's not in there. And I'm glad to see that Brian Hoyer is. So, what is this like third or fourth times a charm for Brian Brian Hoyer? Maybe he can save a starting job this time. 
We'll see. I, I'm going to say that if, if I was getting sacked six times in a game, I would probably want to leave too. Um, so I don't, I don't blame him too much. Um, but, but yeah, color, color, it's looking unlikely. Like, I, I don't know. I know you're not going to say it's a downgrade. I don't know if it really is a downgrade because we've seen Hoyer have like very solid fantasy production in the past. Um, just in terms of, you know, his, his weapons, which is in terms of guys, you should be starting at wide receiver is basically just all Sean at this point. Right. Um, but yeah, just keep it in mind. Hoyer may, will likely start. Uh, this weekend. Back to running backs for a second. Rashad Jennings, he left the game. He has a cast on his left thumb, but he's confident he's going to play in week three. I'm not going to start him or Vereen. Does this matter to you? Not really. Cool. Uh, Dante Moncrief then. Very unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, he has a shoulder injury. Moncrief was off to a very good start this season. Um, a lot of people predicted this as sort of a breakout year for him, really with Andrew Luck. Uh, And the quote that I saw was that it's not a matter of if he misses games, it's a matter of how many he misses. So that's very unfortunate. Um, But again, you know, we, uh, we're not, we're not happy to see anyone get hurt, but is Philip Dorsett a guy that you're interested in now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, He already takes that number two spot. Um, so I think Philip Dorsett is definitely someone that if, you, if he's still on the waivers for any leagues that you, you would go scoop him up and play him in the meantime, especially if we don't know the timetable of um, how long Dante uh, Moncrief's out um, because <clears throat> he was getting a good looks. Andrew Luck liked him there. So that's someone that he likes to throw to as well other than just T.Y. So I think Philip Dorsett will fill in pretty well. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I don't know – I don't have stats on how often they ran it after – Moncrief was hurt this past week, but we know the Colts like to tight end sets. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, Jack Doyle and Dwayne Allen had huge week ones, not big week twos, but there may be a situation where they, they turn to a little bit more two tight end, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, you, you might have two, two tight ends on the Colts. Right. Be usable from week to week. Right. Um, all right, then let's talk about two Seahawks wide receivers both of whom are expected to play, uh, Doug Baldwin and, and Tyler Lockett. Um, Baldwin had the MI, MRI on the knee. That was negative. Tyler Lockett sprained his knee. But they're both expected to play in week three. What I'm concerned about here um, is, you know, with all these guys, with Wilson, with Rawls, with now the, the you know, Baldwin and Lockett, they're all playing, but they're all hurt. Beat up. Um, is, is this – concerning to you if if you're you know a russell wilson owner even if you're not a a baldwin or lockett guy is this a concern for you i mean i think you're a little concerned as it is i mean they really haven't had a very good outing the first the first two games between miami and and la and if you're a russell wilson owner i think you're already wondering what's going on right now so um yeah it's something i'd be concerned on all levels if you're a doug baldwin owner um Russell Wilson owner, you don't know what to expect. And this is a, a division rival here. So San Francisco is going to come and play. Yeah. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Um, the Seahawks are a very weird team right now, and I don't really know what to make of them. Um, but, but that's going to do it, I think, for, for the injuries for this week. If we missed any, sorry. But we tried to get through as many as we could. Um, we're going to talk now about some cool shit. Uh, the first of which I'd like to give Rodgers credit on because Rodgers was calling this basically like right after the draft. Um, not to this extent, certainly, but th- that Will Fuller could be a very usable guy this year. And right now, I think if you have Will Fuller on a team, depending on your current wide receiver situation, like he should be starting for you or at least in your flex. Am I off base in there? You are not, sir. You are very correct. Will Fuller looks good and Brock Osweiler loves him. He gets. Abs- you see Brock Osweiler looking at him all the time, so that that is very encouraging. And he's uh, someone that I absolutely would be. I would love to have him as a flex player because that means you've got a pretty good wide receivers as starters. And I would feel completely solid with having Will Fuller as, even as a flex. But even if your receivers are a little bit, you know, if you're not having, you don't have the great uh, receiving staff, I would be totally fine with him being just a regular starting receiver as well. 
Yeah, for sure. It just 18 targets, nine catches, 211 yards, and one touchdown in his first two weeks. Um, I I saw some stat. I think he's like one of like the first. Like he's like one of only three wide receivers or something to have back to back hundred yard games in his first two games in the NFL. Like wow. that's pretty wild. Yeah, that's um that's some historical stuff. Um, so so Will Fuller, you know, I mean, keep an eye out for any sort of signs for regression. But right now he's got very high target volume, which means that even though he's being targeted down the field a lot, you know, he's going to have like a lower catch rate right now. It's about 50%. Um, it shouldn't really matter because he's going to get enough targets to make up for it. Um, so that is definitely very cool. DeMarco Murray, um, two touchdowns this week. He was PPR running back six. DeMarco Murray is looking like the targets that he's getting, even though he's not getting too, too many carries are really going to make him a viable, viable running back the whole year. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, what you're losing in, in rushing uh, attempts, you're getting in receiving attempts as well. Which So, you know, now that a lot of uh, leagues, too, are going to that PPR format, helps out even more for you. Yeah, a- absolutely. Um, DeMarco's just been, um, you know, he's been very, very good so far. So, so keep playing him and, and don't worry about it. Uh, staying with the Titans, I'll, I'll skip over the next one in our notes for the moment. But staying with the Titans, Delaney Walker kind of, um, after a disappointing week one, really, really came back and did well this past week. Um, six targets, six catches, 83 yards and a touchdown, PPR tight end one. Um, is this a sign of things to come or, or is this kind of like a high week for him for you? Um, I, I mean, I think it was a very good week. Um, but Delaney Walker's always been that solid, consistent, you know, pass catcher for the Tennessee Titans for quite some time. So I don't think it's a fluke. I think he's still going to be a top tight end. Um, he had a very nice game. So, but I, I would still expect him to be, you know, performing within that that level. Um, the only thing I question, you know, is is bouncing back to, you know, who do you think's going to be the, you know, the actual number one target for Mariota? You think it's going to be Delaney Walker? Or you think Tajay Sharp? Um, oh, that's a good question. Oh I think, man, because I think that's like the biggest question now is. You know, who's actually going to, you know, is it going to be one week it's Tajay Sharp, the next week's Delaney Walker, or, or you, know what I'm, you know what I mean? Or is there going to be that consistent, he, here's my number one guy, and then next guy's getting this workload? I think, let me put it this way, I think Tajay Sharp is going to finish the season as the, um, the guy with the most targets on the team. But mm-hmm. I think Delaney Walker is going to be a more consistent week-to-week fantasy option uh, because Tajay Sharp is mostly tar- targeted on very short routes and sort of like possession receiver type stuff. And right. I don't think he's going to be a big red zone guy either, whereas Delaney is their primary red zone option. Sure. Um, so, so, yeah, let's, uh, let's move on to um, Matt Forte, dude. Holy, holy cow. Uh, <laughs> Matt Forte, yeah. his, his workload has been wild so far. He hit it, uh, I think he hit is, his career high on Thursday. Um, which was a career high for him. Um, he had 30.9 PPR points. Um, Matt Forte is on pace for 472 touches this season for perspective to Marco Murray's 2014 campaign where he was like the ultimate bell cow of recent memory. He had 449 touches. Um, one, what's going on here? And then two is like, is, is this something that like we should expect to continue? I, I just, I'm so shocked by it. I, I don't, think we should but in the same sense I don't know I mean they're already like I think that's their game plan is to just ground and pound but I think we all expected more Bilal Powell as well yes. um, Jets have always kind of been a you know a ground and pound team uh whether it was Rex or Todd Bowles and but they really are just loving Forte to stay in there it's just like I wonder if like Forte just like looking at the sidelines like when am I going to get pulled up you know for a, maybe a breather um I love it and a lot of the nice thing for a lot of uh, you Forte owners, me being one, um, everyone was a little bit down on Matt Forte this year. So you got him at a pretty good price. Yes. So I would say temper your expectations just a little bit. I mean, for he just hit his career high with rushing attempts. and the, the, he's, a, he's a seasoned running back. So you would assume – and he's had injury, uh, an injury history. So you would assume they would want to, you know, 
slow his roll a little bit with those uh, attempts. But he looks good, man. He's getting those touchdowns. He's getting good rushing yards. So uh, a very nice price that you have, Matt Forte. Yeah. I, I, am, I, am I being too much of a skeptic to say he's a sell-high candidate? Mm, I don't want to sell Matt Forte, to be honest with you. Um, okay. But it's not a bad option because I don't – you're not – you can't expect him to be rushing 30 times a game. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's just not – like like I said, he's on pace for the 472 right. touches. Like, there's zero chance he gets there. So – You're really surprised if he gets to 400, you know? So if, if you're someone – with a lot of these injuries going on right now, there's so many injuries, if you're someone that's really depleted in – um, in your receivers, and you have a, you know a wealth of you know steady running backs. I would absolutely uh-huh. sell high to get the value now, so you can get yourself the receivers that it's worth, or maybe a little over the worth, and um, you get the price now until you know you see that his carries do go down a little bit. He's not putting up such ridiculous points, so it's yeah. not a, it's not a bad option either. So if you're getting if you're getting what it's worth or a little bit more. And you need those receivers, um, do it because he's not going to have these games all year. Okay, fair enough. Um, let's talk about Marvin Jones. He had eight catches for 118 yards this past week. Um, he's he still hasn't found the end zone, but the guy's got a 27.5 percent target share. Um, if you're not familiar with target share, that is a very very good number. Um, is Marvin Jones is is Marvin Jones legit at this point? Are you? Trusting him as the Lions' number one? Oh, yeah. I'm so cool with Marvin Jones. Uh, you know, if you just added one touchdown to even, like, one of his weeks this week, like, that's – I think this – what what we'd be saying right now is a totally different option. You know, it totally be, would be totally different. The guy would be putting up crazy numbers for fantasy um, versus, you know, he's just getting these catches and yards. But for half-point PPR and PPR, these are – this is still very encouraging. It's still great fantasy points. Um it's just extra, and like you said, twenty seven and a half percent target share is insane. So Matthew Stafford's going to have a year this year. It looks like Marvin Jones is going to be one of his that that main target there. So I, I'd be very encouraged with Marvin Jones. I'd love Marvin Jones. So if you guys have him, keep him. Um, I don't think he obviously. I don't think everyone's with Marvin Jones yet, where you could like sell him high anyway. So hold on to him because he's really going to play well for you. Yeah, I, absolutely. Um... Okay, where were we here? Uh, Dennis Pitta is is interesting. He had twelve targets, nine catches, one hundred two yards. Um, it, Pitta is it, he saw lowered snaps this week, which is a little bit weird to me. Um, but I, I mean, in this depleted tight end pool, I think he's he's a guy who should be owned in most leagues, right? Man, that's so weird. The bottomless Pitta, the bottom, bottomless Pitta, dude. He's back. I don't know, man. I don't buy this Ravens offense right now. I think it's so weird. Um, you got Mike Wallace pulling in all these touchdowns, which we're going to definitely talk about in a little bit because I'm, <laughs> that makes me angry. Um, you know, Steve Smith's in there. Uh, he, he had somewhat of expectations for Kamara Aiken, and there's none. Uh, you got Dennis Pitta, who, oh, my God, I, I don't know. Um, I would slow my roll on Dennis Pitta just yet. I would give this offense another week or two. But before we really figure out who's getting, you know, the actual main share of targets um, before we determine anything else and who's a okay. viable option. Okay, fair enough. Uh, tell me about Travis Benjamin since since you're trying to bolt up so much. Oh, I love bolting up, dude. Travis Benjamin, man. Six targets, 115 yards, two TDs. They jagged off all over the Jaguars last week, man. <laughs> it was insane. They might have jagged yeah. off in – the Jaguars last week. Jeez, dude. So, <laughs> You're getting real graphic tonight. <laughs> yeah, but it was, it was a graphic game, man. Who, who would have expected that? In DraftKings, I loaded up on some Jags. I was like, oh, dude, they're going against San Diego. This is the week. <laughs> and they just got shit on. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, listen, we had some expectations for Travis Benjamin this year after seeing what he did in Cleveland. Um, but obviously he was going to take a roll back from – Keenan Allen, but with Keenan Allen being down, uh, you know, he really stepped in. I mean, it's still six targets, but 115 yards, two TDs, Philip Rivers, you know, he's going to be, th- he's going to be slinging the ball a whole lot still. So, and especially with Danny Woodhead going down, that's one of his biggest targets that he's not going to be throwing to. And you know, Philip Rivers is still going to be throwing the ball a lot. So 
it's very encouraging for Travis Benjamin. And I, I think that's, he's going to be um, playable every week. I think I'm right there with you. I'm, I'm buying in. Uh, Sterling Shepard, another guy who's been surprising so far this year. Well, maybe not surprising depending on, you know, your expectations, I guess. But Sterling Shepard this past week, uh, eight targets. He ended up with 117 yards the week before. He had four targets uh, but caught a touchdown. Is Sterling Shepard working his way into um, Will Fuller territory as a rookie wide receiver who we can trust week to week? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, ben McAdoo offense. Eli's looking great. I think the greatest thing, and I think it, it really sucks for Odell Beckham owners, because I think Odell Beckham owners are taking away. Uh, the, I mean, not the owners. Odell Beckham himself is taking off, taking off so much pressure for Sterling Shepard and Cruz that that's what's leaving them open so much, and that's why you're seeing such great productivity from those two guys, and what's hurting Odell Beckham. So we had um, they were talking pretty high about Sterling Shepard this year. He's showing up. Eli Manning trusts him. He's, he's, I think he's had 12 targets in the past two weeks. Correct. So that's and he, and he, and he, and he's a nice slot receiver, man. He, I was just, you know, watching some of his routes today on uh, the uh, NFL network and he's good. So I think he's the real deal. I think he's going to be a, he's going to have a nice rookie year. That's for sure. So, yeah. and especially in that offense, I think all three of those receivers are just, they're going to have some, some good stats as long as they all stay you know, healthy, especially Victor Cruz. So That's fair. I, I'm a little skeptical um, that, that Shepard will be usable week to week just because I think it's it's probably more likely that him and Cruz kind of um, alternate usable weeks, um, mm-hmm. and it's going to be a little difficult to predict. Um, you know, with Beckham obviously still being the guy that you can use every single week um, right. without really a bunch of worry. But it, it is – Certainly a situation where in games that they have to pass a lot, I, I think Shepard will, will end up being a very, very nice play. Um, speaking of being a very, very nice play often, Stefan Diggs, man, geez. Yeah, he torched the pack, who admittedly didn't have Sam Shields, who's their number one corner, and likely would have covered Diggs. But, man, talk to me about Diggs a little bit. All right, so um, you ever see the, the movie This is the End? No, I actually haven't, and my roommates keep telling me I need to watch it. Oh, wow. Okay, so I guess this isn't going to make this as um, glorified. Uh, or I, I guess I, I don't know if I – I had a uh, – I, I don't know if I even want to say it. I want to ruin it for you. But, <laughs> but you know, uh, I'm sorry, Walsh. You listen to that scene, this is the end. The best way to describe this is at the end where Danny McBride has Channing Tatum on a leash as his bitch. Like, that's what Stefan Diggs did to Demarius Randall in this game. Demarius Randall was literally Stefan Diggs' bitch. And he just ran all over the guy. So it was really upsetting uh, week for me, watching Packers lose like that. Stefan Diggs is the man. And I think the Vikings should be so happy that they reached out for Bradford because this, even though, you know, we like Teddy. Um, Teddy's an overall, you know, athletic quarterback who can run the ball, but definitely not as good as a passer as Sam Bradford, and that's what the Vikings need. Um, we're going to hit um, Kyle Rudolph as well, but I think for the pass catchers, this is the best quarterback, and this is what they needed. And for any Stefan Diggs owner, you should be very thrilled because you're going to see productivity every week from this guy. He's super talented, and he's got the quarterback, so that's going to throw him every week on a consistent basis. Yeah, uh, Stefan Diggs is hashtag good and should be started every single week. Um, so we can, we can go from there. Um, we already kind of talked about his injury. Eric Decker also had a great game this past week, by the way, 126 yards and a touchdown. I, I mean, this is definitely good stuff, but I, I don't feel like it's news as much. You know, it's like that this is what – not necessarily the 126 yards, but like this is what Decker does. Decker is a starting wide receiver every single week. It's also not news that he has a big dick. Apparently, it's not. Um, <laughs> apparently, this is this is uh, this is this is uh, what is it the uh, the um, the the Unsullied in Game of Thrones? Oh, you don't watch that either, where they go, it is known. Apparently, it is uh, known. Yeah. Oh well, man, we're really missing on these. Uh... Yeah, we're just we're throwing out references that neither one of us gets. Um, but anyway, hopefully, some people do. I don't know. <laughs> um, let's talk about Matt Ryan, who's who's been great so far this year. 
Um, almost 400 yards and three touchdowns and a two-point conversion. How about that? Against the Raiders, whose defense is apparently terrible after I thought it was going to be very good. Uh, but Matty Ice, is this legit or has it been two good matchups so far? Matt, Matty Ice always has a history to start off strong. And he always has a history to start off bad, uh, to finish bad. Regression, <laughs> regression is always fucking real for Matty Ice. So, Fair enough. Um, I mean, ride the train while it's hot, man. If you're, if you have Matty Ice, like play it while it's hot. But once you see that, di- you know that digression, it don't be surprised. That's all yeah. I have to say. Matt Ryan always finds a way to just like slow down. So we, year after year. Yeah, I, I think he's extremely matchup based, and he's he's had a couple good matchups. Um, yeah. But that being said, when he has more good matchups, don't be afraid to play him in the future. Absolutely. Um, Dez, Vinny and I talked about this after you know Dez had the one catch on the five targets. Dez got targets. Like it was the Giants' defense. The Giants schemed to take Dez out of the game and purposefully left Witten and Beasley open. That's something that they've done in the past. They did it again here. Dez this week, 12 targets, 7 catches, 102 yards. Um, He's going to have touchdowns on the way, too. We know Dez scores touchdowns. Double-digit touchdowns isn't like an if for him. It's a when. Yeah. Uh, So if you're a Dez owner, are you completely cool now? Yeah, I mean, if you were to panic after week one, that's crazy. I mean, listen, Dez Bryant is just – just physically before he even gets on the field uh, is just – a matchup disaster. He's he's a big dude, fast. So, on top of he's super so skillful. Um, it's just Dak Prescott getting comfortable. Obviously, you saw that first game. Uh, it was the giant scheme, but also he, it was his first game. So he wants to check down, make sure he's making the easy passes. Once he's getting more comfortable out there, you're going to see the deep balls being thrown to Dez. You're going to see Dez go up for those crazy catches. So, um, you guys should be fine. Start Dez. Don't be silly. Agreed. Uh, Corey Coleman had a huge game, two touchdowns. Uh, you know, we know McCown's not there. Is this repeatable or is this sort of just a, well, it happened and now we can't really use it? It's, it's kind of um, disappointing to see, you know, because I think it would be fun to watch more Corey Coleman with McCown being in there. So I think this is a step back for Corey Coleman, for fantasy owners, to see what, you know, his true um, – ability will be for production because obviously with McCown being out, we don't know what to expect from uh, Corey Coleman not being Corey Coleman's fault though. So I wouldn't go into throwing him in the lineup right away again, um, just because of the quarterback issue. Agreed. Uh, D'Angelo has been insane so far this year. Um, it's a, I'm as someone who owns D'Angelo in a couple of leagues, I'm very, very sad because I don't also own Le'Veon Bell. Um, but I mean, is at this point, we just have to expect that D'Angelo Williams is going to put up huge weeks, right, when he's the guy? Dude, he's fucking fun to watch, man. Yeah, he really is. He's, uh, he's a ton of fun to watch, um, particularly when he's scoring a bunch of points for you. Yeah, but, I mean, what do you think? With Le'Veon coming back, once Le'Veon comes back, right, this is the last week that D'Angelo is the, the actual full starter. I mean, but you got to think, like, they can't just – not play D'Angelo like he's obviously he's not going to get the whole uh the the primary workload um but I mean you can't you can't deny what he's doing out there yeah it's just yeah, he, he's he's insane he can't rot on the bench and, and right. I don't think he will because I think the Steelers you know they, they know Le'Veon's injury history um right it's so to, to me, you know, Le'Veon should be the guy getting the bulk of the workload, but D'Angelo Williams should be seeing 8 to 12 touches a game, even when Le'Veon comes back. I don't know if that makes him usable in fantasy on a week-to-week basis. And it certainly hurts Bell's, um, you know, uh, potential, but if I were the Steelers, that's what I would be doing. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, uh, Kel. Kelvin Benjamin, um, two more touchdowns this week, nine targets, a guy that I was very, very skeptical on. I'm pretty sure I went on like a legitimate two-minute rant on how he shouldn't be drafted as high as he was, and I am eating my words at this point. Is this legit, or, or is there still a chance um, that, that Kelvin Benjamin is, is just kind of riding high right now? No, this is legit. Um, 
Kelvin was Cam's man two years ago as well. Obviously, the Panthers weren't as good, so and that was his rookie year, so you really weren't seeing as much. But Cam loves Kelvin Benjamin, so when he had, he didn't have him last year, that's a big hit. But we still saw how high octane that offense was last year, all year. So Kelvin Benjamin, if he's if he's healthy, he's another physical freak. He's huge, dude. Cam's yes. gonna be lo- Cam's gonna be lofting into him all day, man. The targets are gonna be there. The, the catches are going to be there. The touchdowns are going to be there. Kelvin Benjamin is the real deal. That's fair. I, I don't think necessarily the um, the performance of these past two weeks is something we should expect every week, but I'm coming around to the idea that uh, he, is, he is good and he's going to be very usable each week. The last guy we have for cool shit, Melvin Gordon. We kind of already talked about him. 24 carries, 102 yards, and a touchdown this past week. Three uh, targets, three catches, and 18 yards. Um, Melvin Gordon's played very well this year, and now he's going to have the opportunity to be a bell cow. Um, I don't know. Any, any Anything else on that, Tom? No, I'm just uh, a little upset. I always find a, a, a player that I'm always one year earlier on. <laughs> like, like Lamar <laughs> yeah, Miller, yeah, I was Arkham early on. Uh, Melvin Gordon, I was huge on. Doesn't even get in the end zone once last year. This year, he's Looking to the form where I believe he is, he's a good running back um, with a now an injury, injury-ridden uh, team there. So Melvin Gordon's going to be uh, heavily used, and you're going to expect a lot more from him this year. Absolutely. Let's uh, let's talk about some weak shit, Don. Sammy Watkins has 11 targets, six catches, and 63 yards through two weeks. He keeps talking about how he's going to play through this injury. If I'm a Sammy Watkins owner, I want him to not play through this injury and sit and get, get healthy. Am I off base there? No, because even I saw the one catch where he, uh, I think it was just a bad pass or whatever it was, and he like um, he like landed he he like fell like I guess reaching out for it, and you he didn't even like land on his like because he landed on the ground, but like when he was getting up, he was still limping on his foot, and it wasn't like he hit his foot or anything like that. So I think even just getting back up and putting pressure on it right away is still nagging him. So there's obviously a, a really negative effect to this injury. Like, it's not going to go away. So him just continually play on it, is, it's, you're not going to get his best performance. Uh, so that's something, as a Sammy Watkins owner, I'm, I'm pretty frustrated about. But if I, were, I would want him to sit as well. If I, if, so I'm, I'm on the same basis as you. It's just not, it's not helpful at all. Fair enough. Danny Amendola had two touchdowns this past week. Um, are you buying anything about his performance? No, it was it was uh, surprising. Danny, Danny Omendola obviously has the uh, the talent to do it, but he's just always hot and cold, very injury ridden. Um, so don't buy into, don't don't invest heavily into it. Yeah, he uh, he only had twenty four percent of the snaps um, in in that game. Chris Hogan was was I believe up around the seventy five percent mark. There you go. Uh, it was a very 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 fluky game for for Danny Amendola. Uh, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't read into it at all if I were you. Mm-hmm. Uh, Golden Tate, two catches, 13 yards, nine targets, though. Uh, this sucks, obviously, if you're an owner of his, but are, are you optimistic for the rest of the year? Um, no, I, I think that Marvin Jones is going to be that number one receiver. I agree. So Golden Tate, I think, is, is not going to be the, the man that everyone was hoping he would be. I think he's still going to be like a nice PPR option, but sure. Um, I think he's, I think he's a I think he's a flex receiver, but that's as much as that's I would not know. where he was drafted. Certainly, right. You were, right. everyone is everyone was going in the plans that he was that number one receiver. So looking right. at him, I looking at him like he, when he was uh, in when uh, Calvin Jobinson was hurt that year and he blew up for those amount of weeks. So yeah, absolutely, which is not happening. Uh, Antonio Brown with a very rare down week, uh, four catches, 39 yards. Um, you know, obviously real week, but like, what are you going to do sort of, or is there any, do you have any concern for Antonio Brown going forward? No. Cool. Um, same thing for AJ Green here. Disappointing after his huge week one, only two catches for 39 yards. Um, any concern here, or is this just kind of, you know, you deal with it and move forward? I think at this point, um, Everyone has had some sort of disappointing week from every big receiver, whether it's injury or um, not that strong of performance. Um, so, like last, like last week, OBJ, uh, Des Bryant, um, 
Julio Jones. So you got Antonio Brown, AJ Green. So these are all these top receivers. So um, don't worry. Let's get the, the bad game out now, and let's continue to, to roll for the rest of the rest of the season. Very much agreed. Uh, we'll talk about two tight ends in one here. Kobe Fleener and Gary Barnage um, both had very, very disappointing week ones and followed them up with slightly better but still disappointing week twos. Um, if you're someone who drafted either one of them, are you, are you looking elsewhere or are you kind of sticking with it? I have Fleener in one league, and I'm going to stick with him for another week or two. Uh, Breeze was looking at him. There was a bunch of incomplete passes to him as well. So it's Eight targets. Right. So that's encouraging. Now he's got to obviously catch the ball. And, 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 but the fact that there was eight targets there, historically Drew Breeze loves his tight ends. So it could just be Fleener getting more comfortable with the offense um, and Drew Breeze. Um, now Gary Barnage, again – He's got to deal with quarterback issues like the Browns always do. So that's someone where I would start possibly looking elsewhere. I think I'm on the same page as you there. Um, you know, the old maxim is rookie quarterbacks love their tight ends. Um, I, I, I don't think it's really worth it to try and, to try and uh, target a guy who's underperformed relative to expectation the first two weeks who now has a third-string rookie quarterback as, his, as the guy throwing him the ball. Right. Um, Fleener, you would think unless he performs so badly moving forward that, um, you know, he starts losing snaps, he's got to just naturally kind of get back to um, at least like okay production. I mean, he's got a 25% catch rate so far this season. This is a guy with a historically uh, a high 50s-ish catch rate. Right. Um, so you, you would think that at some point that will kind of get back to its normal um, Mike Wallace, two touchdowns this past week. Uh, is this – is Mike Wallace – is his production repeatable? Should you be starting him? I mean – They're going against Jacksonville next week, and then the following week is Oakland. Again, like I said, I don't really know what to gauge on this, this Baltimore offense right now. I don't even know how to fathom the fact that Mike Wallace is blowing shit up right now and has – what does he have, three TDs in the season already? He's, 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 he's like a he's in, he's a top ten receiver at the moment. Uh, I, don't, I don't think uh, any players wanted to give me more of a migraine than Mike Wallace and watching this shit happen. Um, I don't know. I mean, you can – he's got some favorable matchups uh, if you have them uh, and your receivers are, you know, decent or you don't have those, those stud receivers. I would still play him, but – I don't really, I don't really want to expect that this is going to be all season. So, but again, I don't know. I really don't know how to gauge this offense. Like I said earlier, so I kind of want to watch what goes down and see who the primary targets stay to be. Um, but what do you, what do you think about Mike Wallace in, in, in this offense here? I think you should probably play him the next two weeks in those good matchups, and then you should try and sell him as hard as you can possibly sell him. That's... Um, I mean, he's he's got twelve targets. Uh, we just talked about how Kobe Fleener has a. Um, you know, a 25% catch rate. Mike Wallace has a 25% touchdown rate on his targets. Um, you know, most wide receivers sit somewhere around 6% or so. Uh, so this is not something that's sustainable over the course of a season for a guy with 12 targets to, um, you know, to be getting three touchdowns for, for every 12 targets. Uh, it, it's just, again, good matchups. Um, he's definitely the starter for them. You should sell him after the next two weeks is what I think. I think that uh, is the best advice. Absolutely. Good job, Walsh. Well, thank you. Uh, let's talk about Alan Robinson, um, who we got, a, we got a question via email this week, um, you know, with, where someone called him uh, a bust. And, and I don't want to call out this guy, but um, at the same time, I think it's very early to be calling Alan Robinson a bust. He did not have a good week this week. Three catches on five targets for 54 yards. That being said, he was being covered by Jason Verrett, who's one of the top corner uh, cover corners in the league. Um, and historically, Allen Robinson has kind of struggled versus good cornerbacks uh, and, and just really, really beat up bad cornerbacks. Um, so I'm not worried about Allen Robinson, are you? No, not at all. It's a bad two weeks. The Jaguars just don't look good right now. So no one looks that well. Um, so 
he's got some favorable matchups for the next few weeks. I think this is where they build their confidence. They sling the ball a lot. Um, and you see the production that you were planning on getting from Allen Robinson. Again, everyone's had bad weeks already, all the top receivers that you were looking for. So you just can't panic right away. Um, Allen Robinson is a stud receiver. Um, he's got favorable matchups coming up. So get ready to play him and, and get ready to get that, um, get those fantasy points that you wanted from him. Absolutely. You mentioned those matchups. It's, it's Baltimore, Indianapolis, and Chicago over the next three weeks. I would expect Allen Robinson to eat over those three weeks. Um, so if, if you have him, don't panic. Don't try to sell him. Don't do anything rash. Just keep playing him. He'll be fine. Uh, Todd Gurley is another interesting one. Um, just really, really not, not great in terms of efficiency so far this year, which is what he really made hay on last year. Are you starting to worry about him? Uh, it's just, it's so, uh, it's not encouraging. You know, everyone paid a very high price for Todd Gurley and you're not getting what you need at all. You, you need Todd Gurley to be producing. And you, you went into the mindset that Todd Gurley is basically the Rams offense, which he was last year, but <laughs> nothing's going on. Um, it's concerning. He's not getting the, the offensive line is not putting the holes that he needs. You're not getting the, the rush yards that you need from him. I wouldn't say panic just yet. He still is a very talented back. He's very good. Um, but it is concerning the past two weeks of where um, he is right now. Yeah. I, I'm kind of of the mind that he just naturally has to um, do better than this just due to his talent level. Like he's getting the work. He he had 20 touches each of the past two weeks, that's enough where if you give Todd Gurley 20 touches, um, he should be able to get you a decent day. So, uh, you know, the Rams are potentially the worst. You know, they're a fantasy black hole, basically, but but I would think Gurley can climb out. Um, right. Mark Ingram is, has been concerning as well. Just, um, you know, last week, 58 yards rushing, 29 receiving yards. The week before, 30 yards rushing, 17 receiving yards. Uh I'm sorry, I got those completely mixed up. It was the opposite. This past week was the, the 30 yards rushing. Um, are, are you concerned about Ingram moving forward? A little bit, actually. Uh, I'm, 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 a little bit more, I'm a little bit more concerned about Ingram. You know, this was one of the uh, running backs this going into this season where it was right before the next tier of running backs fell into place where you had those the, uh, like the next like 15 mid-level running backs. Like this was Mark Ingram was supposed to be – that last top tier guy that you were looking for him and like Doug Martin were in the same area and you're just not getting what you need out of them. Um, 30 rushing yards and 17 receiving yards. That's just, it's garbage. And then you got 58 rushing yards and 29 receiving yards. So it's not what you need. And I'm sure you were planning on having, so I would be a little discouraged as a Mark Ingram owner and wondering what's going to go on uh, for the rest of the season. That's fair. It, it, um, also in fairness, I think, uh, the Giants' run D is significantly better than, than we thought it was going to be. The, that defensive line with, um, with Olivier Vernon and Damon Harrison added to it has been stout. Yeah, they stopped, uh, you know, they stopped it, Dallas too. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, Zeke, Zeke averaged two and a half yards per carry against them. Um, you know, Ingram didn't do much better. Uh, I, I think that might be a case of the Giants or a defense potentially to avoid running backs against this year rather than Ingram being bad. But his snap share is also concerning. 58% last week, that's, that's not what we wanted. We were expecting closer to a 70 or 80% for right. Ingram. Uh, John Brown, dude, like what's, what's going on? Panic One bush. Catch? One catch? Are you, are you ejecting? Are you ejecting from the John Brown plane? I'm like not cool with John Brown right now. That's, I think that's pretty fair. I think that's really fair, actually. Uh, I mean, he's had only two catches in the past two weeks, and he's gotten you maybe a total in the past two weeks of three points or something like that. I mean, it's it's not good. You you would think you you know you were hoping you, to get a good price out of John Brown, but Carson Palmer's going to sling it to all of his receivers, and that's not happening. John Brown is just I don't know if he's in a funk or whatever it is, but it, and he's not he's barely playing over fifty percent of the snaps. That's that's concerning. Oh, very much so. Um, you know, I, you might have been fooled today or this past week when you saw a deep touchdown to a Jay Brown and then realized it was Jerron Brown and right. not the guy that you have on your roster. So yep. that's, uh, that's doubly painful, I would think. But um, 
But yeah, John Brown might might not be what we thought he was going to be this year. Um, so, are you are you dropping? Or are you keeping on the bench? I keep him on the bench for one more week before I just drop him. But it's if after next week, if you're not seeing anything, that's when you could really start looking to go elsewhere. Very much agreed. All right, Don, let's talk about some waiver wire pickups. Um, you know, just kind of guys that you would want to target. I, I put down at QB, um, Derek Carr, who's probably owned in your league, but if he's not, um, should definitely be should definitely be owned. Um, the Raiders Absolutely. are going to pass way more than I expected this year because their defense is actually very bad, whereas I thought it was going to be decent. Um, the other guys I had were Tannehill and Flacco. Tannehill plays the Browns this weekend. Um, you mentioned the Ravens matchup, and I don't remember it right now. Um, but both have been pretty decent so far. Did you have anyone else on the QB front? Well, what do you think about Sam Bradford? Uh, that's an interesting one, actually, that I didn't even really think about. Um, I don't think I would be prioritizing it, um, but, but he, he might be worth it, you know, with, with Diggs being what he is, um, as well as, you know, the, um, them potentially having to pass the ball more than they want to with AP out. So, yeah, I don't, I don't hate it, actually. I'm, I'm pretty cool with it. Again, as someone I, I might maybe a year early where I picked him up in all four of my leagues last year. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but I was – I forgot about that. But he's out of the – listen, obviously uh, the biggest thing with Bradford for a bunch of years was super talented but always hurt, so we really didn't get to see the potential. And then we finally saw him in Philly, but he was in an offense that didn't fit him. This could be the his home where – we see Bradford for what he really is, and he's got the receivers that he likes, and we'll talk about tight ends in a second, but he brings a lot of value to Kyle Rudolph. He likes Kyle Rudolph. He's hitting digs. So I I like Bradford. So if he's there and you, and you have a solid QB and you, you just have a, you know, a roster spot or someone that you need to drop anyway, I would snag him. Hell yeah. Okay. That's, that's, a, that's pretty fair. Um, let's move on to running back. The guys that I had down here were, you know, basically just sort of the injury guys mm-hmm. um, where, you know, you've got the McKinnon-Asiata combo in your league. You've got the Riddick-Washington combo where Riddick is probably owned. But Washington probably isn't and might have some value. Uh, you've got Jay Ajayi. That situation's a little bit um, weird. Which we actually skipped on with Arian Foster. Did we, right? did we really? Yeah, um, I'm thinking about it now because I remember I actually want to talk about uh, Kenny and Drake. Um, oh, yeah, you're totally right. I skipped right over that one. So let's talk about the Arian Foster injury. Go for it, Don MD. Well, I don't know if this is a shocker to anyone, but Arian Foster's hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little bit earlier than I guess we were expecting. I think we were hoping to at least get two full weeks out of the guy. Um, <laughs> but groin injury, he's had this in the past. Um, it's looking like he's iffy for this week. So I'm going to just just say he's not going to play this week. But who knows? He could. But knowing Arian Foster, he might sit, but it likely won't miss more than two weeks. Um, but there is a mix of uh, running backs here. I think they've kind of lost um, – what's the word I'm looking for? Um, faith in JHI a little bit. I know they were kind of talking up Kenny and Drake a little bit. So what do you think with that running back mix? I mean, I think any of the guys there um, could be potentially worth a pickup uh, just to see if someone really takes – the job, particularly this week, because this is a rare week where the Dolphins are going to be a big favorite. So whoever, um, you know, whoever it's really looking like is going to be that starting running back is going to get the most majority of those carries is probably going to produce this week. Right. Um, Kenyon Drake, I know he got the touchdown. I know Ajayi got most of the work there uh, once he went down. There's also Damian Williams and Isaiah Pete in the mix. If I'm going anyone, I think, think I'm going Ajayi, but it's um, I he, they, he definitely hasn't done much to endear himself there. Right. That's fair. Uh, I think it's either Ajayi or, or you know, can you drink? I wouldn't go and pick up Isaiah Peed. <laughs> That's <laughs> generally generally a good life decision is not picking up Isaiah <laughs> Peed. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it is what it is, I suppose. So. Um, and then, yeah, good call on, on Foster, because when I was talking about Ajayi, I was like, wait, did we even talk about Foster? I couldn't even remember. Um, but yeah. a- anyway, I, the, other, the other sort of running backs I put down were, you know, the Fozzie and, and Cameron Artis Payne uh, duo, where it, it's going to be difficult to tell really who 
the uh, the lead guy is. I'd probably rather play Fozzie over Cameron Artis Payne just because of the passing down production. Um, your opinion on those guys, and then also any other running backs that you wanted to talk about. Well, I hold a pretty huge grudge, so Fozzie Whitaker, man, I'm still pissed. Um, right, right. But yeah, no. If 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 I were to if I were to take a waiver pick on either, it would be Fozzie. Um, but I would look elsewhere for you know. I think there's a lot of different waiver options right now where you don't have to decide between which Panther running back is going to fill in for Jonathan Stewart for the next few weeks. Okay, that's uh, that's that's also fair. Panther running backs haven't been the best source of uh, production over the past couple of years. Take it from um, me I- personally. <laughs> Don knows. Uh, when you need them more than anything else, they come up and they fail. <laughs> and, and they let, they, and they let Chase English win his second championship <laughs> in a row. <laughs> that, is, that is one of the ultimate grudges. Um, <laughs> all right, so a wide receiver, uh, again, the, we had a couple different guys here. Uh, we, you guys talked about him last week, but Quincy and Nunoy is like the perfect example of a guy who right now has a pretty solid role with the Jets. Yeah. And then, you know, Decker and Marshall are both likely to play, but are a little banged up. So if we get a surprise inactive, all of a sudden a Nunwa becomes like a very, very solid starting wide receiver. Yeah, I'm very cool. Like if Nunwa is still there, that I honestly think that should be your number one waiver priority um, out of all the guys we just went over so far. Especially if one of these guys are banged up, Nunwa is going to get a lot of looks. Um, he seems to be pretty solid, and Fitzpatrick has no qualms in, in looking at him a lot and giving him a lot of targets. Uh, Tyrell Williams is the next guy that you put down six targets last week, and as you said, a big man. Uh, tell me more about Tyrell Williams and, and why you like him. Uh, well, Tyrell Williams had the six targets, which is encouraging. We're talking about him. He's very athletic, pr- very fast as well. Um, but if you look in the past of San Diego too – Philip Rivers has always had a big receiver, whether it was Malcolm Floyd or Vincent Jackson. So he likes having that big receiver, which Tyrell Williams would fit very nicely in. So especially with, you know, his main man, Keenan Allen being out, even though I think Travis Benjamin is definitely that, that number one guy, uh, Philip Rivers is going to be slinging the ball. Like I said, Danny Woodhead is out. So Tyrell Williams, I think is going to be, it's going to fit in very nicely um, right in that spot there. Yeah, he's to me. He, I think he's like a kind of a boomer, boomer bus guy. But um, he's when he booms, he'll probably be a pretty big boom. So definitely worth a, a speculative ad. And then the last guy we had here, we talked about him before, was Philip Dorsett. Don and I both agreed that he was a nice ad going forward as the the um, you know the presumptive second wide receiver on that Colts team until Dante Moncrief comes back. Were there yeah. any other wide receivers you had, or did you want to talk about Dorsett as no, well? I just, want, I just want to say, like, Philip Dorsett's a very safe pickup. Yes, I, I agree with you there. Um, okay, uh, let's move on to tight ends. Um, we got a couple of them here. Uh, you, you've already alluded to Rudolph, so we'll skip, a, we'll skip ahead to him here. Um, Kyle Rudolph uh, is, is interesting. You, you seem to be about the Vikings pass game. Uh, I think I'm buying into Kyle Rudolph. Why should we like him? I think Kyle Rudolph is actually going to have the best year yet. Um, Kyle Rudolph has always been that that guy. Obviously, Vikings like him. They signed him, uh, what is it, two years ago with a nice contract. Um, but we always saw, and we were, then we had high expectations after the contract, but he's always a touchdown or bust type guy where Bradford liked slinging to him last week. So, like I said, I'm just invested in Bradford in this offense. Um, I think he's going to bring a lot to the table for all pass catchers, and I think Kyle Rudolph's going to be that guy that's not just going to be um, an end zone target, but a, a target in general. Yeah, um, you know, you, you guys have heard me talk a lot about target share, uh, you know, this podcast and in the past. Um, Kyle Rudolph's target share this year has been 25%. That is a lot. Yeah, uh, he is lot. clearly the second target on the team, um, you know, ahead of guys like Charles Johnson or any of the other wide receivers or running backs. Um, this is when a, when a tight end is going to get 25% of a team's targets, that's someone that should be owned and probably started every single week. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. The other guys we had here were Jesse James uh, of the Steelers. He had a touchdown this past week. Played 100% of the snaps. He's gotten 12 targets over the past two weeks. I've said before, six targets a week is sort of that number I look for uh, for a tight end. Do you have any anything to add on Jesse James? 
I would just say the only thing is for anyone that's in a standard league, though, um, Jesse James is not a big yardage tight end so far. Looks like he's a lot of targets, but uh, more of like short yardage guy. I uh, got in the end zone last week, so maybe just a, a red zone target as well. But other than that, for like, it goes a lot more of a long way with those those six targets each per game for like the half point PPR and PPR format. But for standard, he really isn't. If he didn't have that touchdown, he's really not having that much of a, produ- a fantasy productive. Uh, past two weeks there you are very correct there um that's that's definitely a good point uh trey burton of the eagles had a very nice game monday night seven targets five receptions 49 yards and a touchdown only in on 43 percent of the snaps um is this someone you're you're interested in or is it kind of just like yeah it was one game against the bears actually that is a good question because do we know the timetable yet did that come out with zach Ertz? uh that's yeah I, i'm not actually sure um that's that's probably something I should have. Wow! So they're they're actually saying that he's a game time decision for Sunday against the Steelers. So okay. um, he's already day to day, which means if that's the case, I think Trey Burton already loses his value. So, yeah. No. So you're, you're if any, right if there. anything, you know he, that I think that Carson Wentz does like his tight ends. But if if Trey if Zach Ertz is already coming back. Trey Burn might not be um, the best option unless you're in a deeper league and you need someone to play and Zach Ertz isn't, um, isn't not going to play, then that's something you could probably stream for the week for more of a tight end roulette type of deal. Right. Uh, and then the last guy we had here was Clive Walford. Um, he had six tar- targets this past week. He got a touchdown. Um, I, you know, I said before, uh, the Raiders are going to have to pass a lot, it looks like, based on how their defense has been so far this year which is not good at all to my chagrin. Um, so Walford to me is, is kind of a guy you should have in that streamer tight end roulette type. Table. Yeah, that's, that's fair. I think he's a, he's a top tier tight end in the uh, uh, tight end roulette. All right. Um, so I think that's going to do it for, for our waiver wire uh, pickups this week. We'll do a quick preview here of the Thursday night game. Um, Because we won't be getting to that game with the rest of our weekly preview. Uh, It's Houston at New England here. Houston's a one-point favorite with a a 40.5 point over under. Uh, My my thinking is this probably just isn't going to be a great source of fantasy production. What's your your take here, Don? Yeah. That's a good question. It's, It's worrisome when you know that Julian Edelman might have to come in as a quarterback. (laughs) <laughs> that's certainly a point so like, yes. it could be more of a just a defensive game um obviously with Houston having a good good defense and New England always come to play no matter who they come for um it's going to be tough to say who's going to be you know who to play New England wise for fantasy production because you don't even know what to expect at this point um for Houston though I think you know you have better options between I think you obviously you still play Lamar Miller um you you play uh deandre hopkins and like we said earlier we like will fuller we're invested in will fuller you play will fuller yeah i i'm i'm right there with you you're playing your texans that are kind of your guys that you play every week i think on the pats the only guy i really want to play is edelman um dependent on gronk status which i'm really not sure um at this point i don't think they're sure at this point Especially if Edelman goes in as QB, he might get some good passing yards for you. <laughs> <laughs> Just that, that Edelman to Gronk connection in the red zone. Oh man, that would be so much fun. <laughs> that would be pretty fun. Yeah, that would be that would be great. Just like two extreme bros. Yeah. Just like hooking up in the end zone. I would like that a lot. Um, anyway, um, I yeah, I mean, there's there's not much here in terms of. Um, you, you know, to overthink things in fantasy. What do you think for Patriots running back? Obviously, you saw a 250-pound LeGarrette Blunt leap over someone. Yeah, he had, like, a huge week this past week. I wouldn't trust either of them because yeah. it's not a situation where they're going to be behind a bunch, so James White would likely be the guy, and it's not a situation where they're likely going to be ahead of a bunch, um, which would make Blunt the guy. I don't want to play either one. It's fair. It's fair. Um, so I, I think that should probably do it. Uh, Don, let's wrap it up for the week two recap podcast with the Timmy Tree of the Week. Before I do the Timmy Tree Week, who do you pick to win the game? Oh, good call. I'm picking Houston. 
I want to say Houston, but I'm going to go New, New England because I just can't ever bet against these guys. They're just that's fair. They pull some crazy shit all the time. So I, that's very fair. So I got two for tree uh, for uh, who I'm going to bring up with tree of the week. The first one is the quarterback of Chicago. Man, do I love putting him right oh, here. Oh God, always the winner. He's He's always the treat of the week in my books. Um, my God, man, just step up. I mean, your team hates you, dude. Uh, we hate you, besides Walsh and Vinny, the only two people that probably like you. I like you, Jay. Um, I think you're a good guy. And then my second is not the treat of the week, but the man of the week, Mr. Walsh. This goes out to you. Cheers, sir. I uh, just want to say thank you for all of your support. It just shows um, someone that you know really didn't play fantasy football but shows the man that he is supports his son so much that he listens to all of our podcasts. He gets to come on here and talk trash to our, to our beloved Nick Shrek with the uh, <laughs> divisional rivals. Um, we love you. We love you, Nick. So um, cheers to you, sir. You are definitely earning the man of the week. Well, well, thanks Don. I, uh, I appreciate that. Um, and I, I think on that note, we're going to wrap it up for this week. So uh, thank you guys for, uh, for, for listening in tonight later podcast. <laughs>